So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Julia Stewart Lounds. Uh, Lounds. She founded Openscapes to champion kinder, better science with less time together. She's a marine ecologist and a data scientist who shifted away from doing her own research to empowering research teams with skill sets and mindsets for open, collaborative, and reproducible science. Um, focus on fostering diverse, inclusive, and leaderful open data science research communities. She is an R community contributor through R Open Science in our studio, a carpentries instructor, and a co-founder of Eco Data Science in Our Lady Santa Barbara. She is a senior fellow at NCES, the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis at the, at the University of California, a 2019 Watsula Fellow, and earned her PhD in Stanford in 2012, studying drivers and impacts of Humboldt squid in a changing climate. And why I'm excited to be introducing her is because I was able to take a workshop with her about five years ago. And that really got me on this journey of trying to become better in science, better as a data scientist, and having more transparency and, and really embracing a lot more of this environment. So I really attribute a lot of why I'm here today is as a result of uh, Julia. So with that, I will pass it over to Julia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex, um, for that great introduction. And thanks to you all, thanks to you all for being here and to Sorti for the invitation. Um, I want to start off by saying how grateful I am for the land where I am here in Santa Barbara, California. And I want to honor the Chumash peoples who have been and continue to be stewards of these lands and waters. So I'm really excited to be here today to talk about open science open science, <laughs> and also Openscape's Better Science um, for Future Us. And so um, better science is science that is more open, reproducible, and efficient. And it's more open, um, it's more diverse, equitable, inclusive, and kind. And it's really thinking about future us, who are ourselves, our teams, and our communities in the next hour, in the next week, and in the next decades. And this is a really important mindset um, writ large, but also particularly important for environmental science where we are tackling these long-term big challenges that we can't do alone. And it's also a real investment um, in time and resources in people. And this is particularly true for data intensive research. And that's because default, to, um, default approaches to data intensive research can feel really lonely and demoralizing. So this is Luke Skywalker after he crashed his plane into the swamp of Dagobah. And he's here um, staring at a challenge that he can't solve with the skill sets he has. And it's really lonely and, and can be really frustrating. And if you can imagine him attempting to use whatever pulleys or ropes or tools he might've had in his plane, um, it wouldn't have been very pretty or something he was very proud of. It wouldn't have been something reproducible or something that he would have really learned from. And it probably wouldn't have gotten him to be where he needed to be on time. But luckily that's not what happens. What happens is that he meets Yoda and Yoda uses the force to solve Luke's problem in a way that Luke never imagined was possible. So the force is open science and it's something that's collaborative and empowering and something that you can learn through mentorship. And so seeing open science, seeing the force here is gonna open up Luke's whole world because he can learn from Yoda. He can see what's possible and not only learn those skills and go on to solve his current challenge, but it's also gonna broaden his whole mindset for what's possible in the future. And so importantly, Luke doesn't go on to defeat the empire by himself. He had a whole community doing so. And like the force, open science is something that brings us together and really diverse, inclusive teams and communities are key to stepping up to the challenges that we face because we can learn and leverage each other's expertise and experiences and work together with empathy in order to, to um, address these pressing issues like climate change and climate justice that none of us can do alone. So these ideas of data science and open science and teamwork and belonging are really key motivators for Openscapes. And Openscapes is really based on my experience moving from lonely research towards open data science and teamwork. And I did that through my team with the Ocean Health Index and also with the open science communities, which I learned about and entered through the R communities. 
And so folks in the Ocean Health Index and the R communities are my mentors. Um, they're my Yodas. And I really have um, been empowered by being no longer self-taught and lonely doing my science, but being community taught and practicing what I learn as a team. So I'm gonna just give a brief background about the Ocean Health Index and these how powerful these communities have been before describing more about um, OpenScapes. So the Ocean Health Index is a project that impact that quantifies the impacts and benefits of oceans around the world. And there's a lot to say about it. And this is actually the 10 year anniversary of um, Ocean Health Index scores. And I don't have time to get into that today. <laughs> but what's relevant here is that we found out the hard way that our default approaches for data analysis were not reproducible even by ourselves. And so getting through this um, um, involved quite a reckoning, but when we got through it, we knew we had a story to tell. So we published our story as our path to better science in less time using open data science tools. And in this publication, we shared how we got to a place where we had more reproducibility and more collaboration in less time so that that gave more time to focus on our real science issues. So in this, um, in this manuscript, we really focused on the tools that, that were useful to us, which is R and Friends and GitHub. And we also described a bit about how we transitioned to common practices together. And so just to highlight two, um, two things here, a common practice and, and a tool that we discussed in the paper. The first thing is we really needed to identify the common parts of our data analysis in order to start working like a team. And so this, um, this is Hadley Wickham's conceptual diagram for data science, where he illustrates the importance of tidying data before beginning to ask your research questions. And this mindset and this conceptual model was really critical for us in order for us to start identifying what the common parts of our work were so that we could start collaborating around those common parts and spend less time reinventing those ourselves and more time and creative energy towards our science. And so one example here in this bottom left is just the idea that first of all, I had a my own script uh, called Julie's script.r that other people could, could source and use. And from there, we had common pieces that we put into a separate um, script and then eventually created this into an R package. And these common pieces can be a lot of this kind of data wrangling and formatting. It can be um, comparing species names or place, place um, study sites and, and different checks and visualizations. So there's a lot of common things that we do that we were able to start um, doing together. A second tool that really helped us reimagine completely the way we work and share and think is our markdown. This is a file type that allows you to put your analyses and your narrative in the same place, and then lets you render that document into different outputs for reporting. And so on the left here is just a, a brief view of an R Markdown document where there's text and code in the same document. And that lets you iterate and reproduce your own work as you go and lets you not have to have your notes maybe in a Word document or your manuscript in a Word document that then you're having, you're having to juggle where your code is and where your output are and paste things around. This lets you do this in one place, which is hugely um, game changing for, um, for analyses. But then what's more is that it really opens up possibilities for communications because um, you can not only render this output in a format like uh, a Word or PDF that you can email to your colleagues, but you can also turn this into HTML and actually then send your colleagues a URL that will always be the most up-to-date. So you can get away from emailing your colleagues saying, oh, here's an update to our document or like, oops, there was the wrong version. You know, here's an update. This really changed the way we collaborated with other folks, but also it made communication of science earlier as part of our daily work. So this, through our markdown, we really had the power of the open web without being web developers. 
So using these tools and these practices really helped me build confidence as an open science contributor. And I've been incredibly lucky to be supported by so many different mentors in the open science community. And as we were developing open educational resources through the Ocean Health Index and actually using our markdown to create eBooks and, and beyond, but also really learning from others and gaining confidence as a contributor and a collaborator, and then also as an instructor and, and co-founder of, of different study groups locally in Santa Barbara. Um, and, and really, you know, this really came down to conversations um, at an R OpenSci Unconf where I could actually meet folks that were building software and start developing language around um, how we do data science and feeling safe asking my questions. So this was a really transformative time <laughs> in my life where I went from being that lonely, demoralized researcher to really feeling empowered and feeling like I had control and, and vision of, of what we could do with science. And so this is when I um, really was interested in, in passing forward what I learned and helping other teams do this as well. Um, so as, the, as that 2017 paper came out and folks started talking about it, it, it did really resonate with a lot of people and folks were asking questions like, what was that really like? Like, how did you really, really do this with a team? Don't just tell me the tools, but how. And so I started having conversations kind of one on one with folks and it really comes down to, you know, we had we had a team, we had a lab group that was already built on trust and we were willing to learn more and, and co-create together. But also, as importantly, um, we were supported to do this as part of our jobs and our PI, our principal investigator, principal investigator supported us to do this. And in this particular case, he didn't have these skills himself, but he trusted us to spend this time and supported us to go to conferences and to spend our time learning and co-creating together. So it's really exciting to see these kind of questions and conversations coming out and the, the fact that this story was really resonating with folks, but it also made other people feel lonelier. Um, I got feedback where folks were saying, you know, I'm not part of a team, so this isn't relevant or I'm not supported, I don't have time, I don't know where to start. And so the idea that something that I found so empowering and was trying to um, help other people um, see themselves in was also isolating, really, really uh, struck me um, pretty hard. <laughs> and so this was a, a moment too, where I was starting to begin to get the ideas for OpenScapes and what, what a, a program would be to, to help folks operationalize what we had done with the Ocean Health Index. And so in 2018, I, this critical moment was when I became a fellow with Mozilla and also became part of the Mozilla Open Leaders Program. So this gave me 10 months as a Mozilla fellow to have support and time with the Mozilla ecosystem to learn and try to build something um, that would become OpenScapes. And so this period was, you know, when OpenScapes turned from a budding idea into a full program. And that was largely because of these mentors and um, the things that I learned through not just open science, but open everything, thinking about open design, open government, and really designing for um, diversity, equity, and inclusion as well. So as I was thinking about this and learning so much, I was also talking a lot and forming a friendship with Allison Horst, who is a data science um, teaching professor at UCSB and also an incredible artist and illustrator. And so through these conversations with Allison, um, talking about open science and data science, she, she was able to really bring the vision for OpenScapes to life. And so Allison created this beautiful artwork that became part of our website and part of all of our um, communications materials, which we also created with, um, with our markdown. So really seeing that um, web development was a place that I, I could, I could um, build out this vision. Um, and so with OpenScapes, the, really, I, the idea is to engage folks and build awareness and, and excitement around open data science, empower them by building confidence and skills and also amplifying them and build them into champions and communities so that more folks feel included and welcome in this open science movement. Earlier this year, um, 
Erin Robinson joined Openscapes as co-director and she has been so phenomenal to work with and her, her strategic vision has really helped see, um, see the engage, empower, amplify ideas as a cycle and something that we can build from together. And so it's been fun to work with her and to be mentored by her as well. Um, and, you know, I think we really complement our, our backgrounds really complement each other. You know, I'm coming from environmental science and data science, and she comes from earth science and data management. So we have these, these complementary backgrounds and also this shared passion for open science and community building. And together we're, we're learning a lot and particularly around data and technology and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and we're really building that all into OpenScapes. So when we're not thinking about open science like the force, we're thinking of it like a, a landscape, an open landscape. And our flagship program through OpenScapes is the Champions Program, which is an open data science mentorship program for research teams. And we've, through the Champions Program, we're helping researchers move from sad and lonely research like the animals in the bottom left to, to thinking more like a team and finding their team and finding common needs at their trailhead while they then start navigating this landscape together. And something that is important to, to describe as well is that there, there are existing pathways in this landscape that are built by the open science communities. Um, so there's existing pathways that folks can, tr can travel safely on or also can, can build additional tra um, trails when needed. But really the idea is to welcome folks to this landscape and help and make sure that, it's, that they're feeling safe participating in open science. So a little bit more about the OpenScape's Champions Program design. Um, we really designed it to complement and synergize with existing efforts. So thinking about how uh, this program could for example, complement Carpentry's workshops or our OpenSci on conferences. And so there's a couple elements that, that went into the design here. The first is that it's structured after Mozilla Open Leaders. That program was so transformational <laughs> in many ways for me, but really the design there was that it's cohort based. It's a remote program by design. The focus is on diversity, equity, and inclusion in that design. And also participants really focus on their own projects throughout the entire program. So they bring their own work to this pro to the program. And then as they learn, they're able to iterate and build into their own work. A second part that we brought in with OpenScapes was the idea of, of teams and, and having curriculum based on open data science and based in our experience with the Ocean Health Index. So really the idea that it's a team where the PI and the lab members, um, if we're thinking about a, an academic example, where they participate together so that everybody can see what's possible and be um, to have agency and support within the team to do more. And another piece we bring is the idea of kinder science. Um, this is the idea that open science is not something that just improves how we share data and methods, but it also improves how we think, work, and interact with each other. And kinder science is something that I'm trying to be braver <laughs> at putting up front in the, in the champions program. That's something that we're learning through our work with diversity, um, equity, and inclusion, and particularly working with Tara Robertson. So, so far we have been working with um, just incredibly awesome teams. Um, we've, we've now led five cohorts um, with about 35 different research teams. And these are teams that are both um, uh, within uh, different research communities, both government and uh, academic and nonprofit and tribal. And it's just really exciting to see and learn with these different teams. So let me tell you a little bit more about what we do in the Champions Program. Really, this is, this is, the focus is to normalize talking about data, to start identifying and addressing shared needs, and then really helping think ahead for future us. And we're really trying to focus on the common parts of data analysis and open science that folks can start um, acting on immediately. And so we, um, on the right there is a screenshot of our lesson series that's available for use and reuse um, and iterated openly as we go. 
So just to walk through these a little bit more, so to create space for data discussions, in our champions program, we have cohort calls with the full cohort of teams, about seven teams at a time, and we meet twice a month. And this is where we introduce new ideas, we discuss how it's related to folks' work, and then they go on to have what we call seaside chats. And these are team discussions that happen in the alternating weeks between the champions cohort calls. And this is a place for teams to start talking about their specific needs and bringing in their whole research team and really starting to normalize these types of conversations around data workflows within their team. Um, and so some of the things that we talk about and introduce in, in the cohort calls and that they explore more during seaside chats are what else exists in the open science community and what other examples there are in, in worlds that are relevant to them. For example, here, this is with NOAA and also with uh, the Tampa Bay Estuary Program. And we find these tools also through GitHub and our Markdown and also through Twitter. So after creating place for these conversations, we also create places for collaboration. And so one of the things we talk about um, in a, among a series of tools and figuring out where folks are starting is talking about GitHub. And so most teams that participate in our program don't come in with a GitHub organization for their lab. They might have individual accounts, but here we talk about creating an organization for their lab. And that can be a place to put common things like sharing common code, having common practices around code, and it's also a place to share resources as we learn more about anti-racism. It's a place for codes of conduct. It's a place to put our values forward. And also using GitHub issues as a place for more conversations and, or, and project management. So through having space in place, they start to identify their shared needs. And this is a really exciting time, like thinking about how to, to do things that you might have thought were individual needs, like learning R or learning GitHub, and then also emerging needs around teams, like how are we going to decide how to name files? How are we going to have coding conventions so that it's easier to review code and to combine code? How are we going to organize data? Um, and through identifying these shared needs, we also can start addressing these shared needs. Because while these might feel like needs that are individual to a researcher or specific to an individual team, the, those, those needs are common well beyond the teams. And so there's resources available for learning R, for learning how to name your files, and there's places to start, and there's places to, to learn with each other, from each other, and then also for each other and start contributing um, ourselves. So then this goes along with thinking ahead for future us. And a big part of this in our conversations circles around onboarding. The idea that as academic research teams or um, government research teams, we have folks coming and going a lot. So how can we create a process for onboarding so that folks can build the skills they need and the shared practices and not reinvent those wheels and slow down um, the time until they can participate in science? And another part of this is amplifying and, and role modeling open science within our broader communities and circles and, and connecting across communities. So there's so many more examples and wins of the awesome work that the champions are doing. And I think these wins are, are so exciting that they're both big and small. Um, keyboard shortcuts that we discuss in our cohort calls are just as important as the data management strategies that they'll be crafting over the next months. So as we think about scaling the OpenScapes, this scaling and sustainability has been something we think of, we've been thinking about from the beginning. And we're thinking about that both in terms of how more teams can use this on their own. So thinking back to the responses to our 2017 paper, the teams that were ready to go and really wanted to know what the next steps are, how can we support those teams? But then also for folks, for the, that other situation where folks are feeling lonely and excluded, how can we create more mentors that can lead more OpenScapes cohorts so that more folks feel more uh, welcome in this landscape? So for scaling OpenScapes in, the, in the, that first case, um, our open educational resources um, are a place to start um, if you're interested in how to do this with your own team. And all of our work, whether it's curriculum, 
code, slides, artwork, and also our upcoming onboarding materials that we're going to fork from the Gavin Fay lab and build from, um, th they're all available for reuse and remixing. And so I wanna talk about this second piece though, about training more mentors to lead champions cohorts, because this is a big part of how we want to sustainably scale this, this approach. And it's really important to us that this is part of people's jobs and that they're paid for this work. Um, so we're interested in how this can be part of long-term capacity building and resilience within different organizations and to really value that labor and expertise. So just an incredibly exciting way we're doing this is working um, with NASA um, and we're supporting NASA Earth Science research teams as they migrate to the cloud. And so there's the current, um, the current inter way that researchers interact with NASA Earth data from all of the satellite missions that go on from NASA is that there's a really heavy emphasis on downloading the data locally to work locally. And this in this new paradigm, the data is gonna stay on the cloud and researchers are gonna move their compute to the cloud. So this means a lot of new skill sets and, um, and, and support. And there will be many tutorials built to help researchers uh, complete this migration and start working this way. And so we've been working with a, a cohort of mentor teams at NASA. So we're working with six different teams um, at NASA who are building tutorials to help researchers in this transition. And again, we're, we're taking this cohort model and focusing on people and process and technology. And so we've started building a community across these different NASA teams who are building these NASA specific science tutorials in green. And through our mentorship and, and through their conversations, we're starting to identify those common pieces from those tutorials so that we can pull those common pieces out into a shared resource, which we're calling the NASA Earth Data Cloud Cookbook. So it's been this really exciting um, process to work with these NASA teams and to design this together. And you know, we have conversations where one of the data centers describes their code review process and how they are um, reviewing each other's work and what that process looks like. And then we're taking that process for our, all, our whole cohort. So it's really exciting to see um, different opportunities for collaboration and, and reuse. And this uh, Earth Data Cloud Cookbook is in active open development. Um, we're just at the very beginning, but the idea is that this will be this common resource for a, a common starting place for researchers using NASA data on the cloud. And something that's also really exciting is the technology that we're using to build this book. So we're, we're using Quarto, which uh, builds from what our studio learned um, from building our markdown. And so Quarto built, combines our Markdown and Jupyter Notebooks natively in the same place with Markdown. And this allows us to have this shared space and common space um, where we can interoperate across R and Python since we've got a lot of different skill sets in our mentor cohort and people can work natively in the way that they're most comfortable. So this is really exciting to be a part of. So we're learning so much. Um, this slide, <laughs> I had to stop because it was getting too big of just the things that um, we've been learning and that have influenced the way we're, we're trying to iterate and design into OpenScapes and both in terms of the curriculum that we teach and also the design of the program and the scaling. And really our focus has been on strengthening our approaches to diversity, equity, and inclusion and thinking about how that interfaces with open science, especially in this evolving software scape. So there's so many intersecting groups doing impactful work and I'm just so excited <laughs> and grateful for all of their work. Um, to come back to the idea of um, better science for future us and to, to wrap up here, um, you know, this something that is just critical that we really didn't say in the paper was just how this investment was part of our jobs and it was supported by our PI, which meant we were evaluated on it, we were given time and supported, and that this transition really required these new, not only skill sets, but also mindsets and confidence and agency within our team. And that this is possible because it started with trust and psychological safety and let us build into a team of leaders and mentors. So to, to just end um, here as we go into continue the sortie conference and thinking about investing in open science and better science for future us, 
I'm really looking forward to the conversations about how we can support and incentivize open science together. And from thinking from researchers to societies to institutes and really value modern contributions to science. And that comes in the form of products um, that we might not have thought about before, like educational materials, blogs, dashboards, and artwork, but also through people, through the trainers and mentors, the research software engineers, the community managers who are doing this really critical work to support the transition to open science. Um, and just one final thought to end with is, um, you know, as we think about open science as a movement, we can, there's a lot to learn from other movements that, um, that are just making incredible progress in other fields. And so we've been, we've been really struck with uh, data feminism and climate feminism and get out the vote as, as movements and are trying to understand how we can bring this to open science so we can do better science together. So thank you so much. Um, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the conference. Thanks, Julia. I appreciate that. That was a great talk. Um, we do have some questions that are pouring in. Uh, so if you're ready, we can get right into it. So our first question is from Cole Bruxton, and he asks, uh, do you have suggestions for junior researchers, i.e. grad students and postdocs who are trying to get their lab group, et cetera, to buy into these types of ideas? What are some things you would encourage single researchers, especially graduate students, to do when they might not have the support from their institution, department, or labs? That's a great question. Um, I'm also curious if if we're doing this here or moving into the breakout or the other Zoom room. Good question. Um, so right now we're going to be doing a bit of a Q and A. So we're going to be okay. answering these questions on the spot, and then we'll do a breakout room where we can discuss a little bit further uh, at the top of the hour. Okay. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure. Great. Um, so I would say, um, um, so this is a great question and a big question, but I think maybe one of the things um, you could do is use the spaces you already have. Like if you have a lab meeting or a journal club, maybe you could bring a, a video, you know, watch this video <laughs> in that a uh, lab group meeting or read and bring an open pa science paper or something about data management, like bring, bring an idea of open science to the places you already are so that you can start having these conversations and really showcase what's possible. Um, I think it's been really hard, I think, to imagine what's possible with open science until you, you see it and, and can, um, it's important to really remember that there's like that feeling of isolation <laughs> if you don't understand it. And so how to kind of help help showcase what's possible in the places where you already are. Does that help? <laughs> I think that was a great answer. Uh, we have another question from Karina and Dieter. They ask, thank you so much. I'd love to hear more about how you include team members, collaborators, et cetera, from groups who are traditionally underrepresented in academia. It is something I work on a lot, but I know it's a work in progress and I'm interested in learning more. Yeah, that's a, um, that is a great question. So we, um, we just had an open call for the Champions Program, which is the, the first time we were able to do that. So instead of having a, um, a team like NOAA sponsor a cohort for, their, for NOAA, we were able to get funding through Code for Science and Society and announce publicly that um, anybody could join. And that was a, a, one strategy to try to, um, to, to try to focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, and make this more available for folks that might not already be within a certain community or group. Um, and we also um, worked with a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant with Tara Robertson in order to really examine our language and our design and think about what we could do better. Um, I, yeah, I, I also, you know, through our networks and through Twitter, reaching out to specific groups that we knew about and we're already kind of keeping a, um, you know, keeping an eye on and learning from and seeing um, how to, how other groups were amplifying and how we could connect with them. Hi, Dieter and, and Karina. We have a question from Malika who asks, do you have a strategy to appeal to more senior researchers to enroll them in a program for mentorship and leadership in open science? If not, do you think this would be worth it? 
It's a really good question. Um, I we've been focusing mostly on early career researchers. Um, I think that there's this this um, really exciting opportunity for you know folks in kind of my generation of 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 um, of academic leaders, you know, folks who are now having tenure and whatnot, because we we kind of grew up without with, with having to figure it out on our own and never had an experience where we saw what was possible and are now in charge of our labs and are feeling this immense pressure to do better than what we've done than what we've experienced before, but not knowing where to where to start. So I think that um, I think you know. So that's where we've been focusing is like kind of the where is the immediate need and where are folks maybe not um, already invested in open science. Maybe the idea is that we're looking for folks that um, are either neutral or maybe curious, but not resistant. And I think that that, so I, I haven't thought as much about, um, about the uh, senior researchers, um, but I know a lot of other groups are, but I, I guess, I'm not answering this very well in the moment, but I guess I'm I'm thinking of like looking for folks that are curious and open to it rather than um, trying to change everything all at once. I don't know if that is a better way to think about that. I think that makes sense. You don't want to force people, I guess, <laughs> into some mentorship roles. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we have a question from Hamali. Is there anything for people who are doing research alone to join in an existing team? I'm an early career researcher at a new university and I'd love to get training before I have to build up my own lab. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and so, yeah, the um, yes, <laughs> there's a lot that you can do. Um, there are communities likely on your campus, but certainly remote online communities that can help you feel like you're not doing research alone <laughs> anymore. And, and like the idea of, of learning new tools that can make your day-to-day -day research faster and better and, and set you up for doing more reproducible science and open science. Um, there's also, I can, I can follow up and put this in the chat, but there's, um, there's other mentorship, open science mentorship programs like the Turing Way and like, um, other groups that have come out of the Mozilla Open Leaders program too that are really powerful as well. So I can I can follow up with some links. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, a question from Rachel says, thanks very much. Can you tell us how teams apply and get selected for the champions program or the attributes that open skates are looking for in a team? Yes, great question. Um, so far as we've been growing the um, most of our cohorts have been supported for a specific community, like for the US fisheries, uh, government fisheries folks or something. So we we've only had one of these open call cohorts so far, but our intent is to do them at least every year because it's like um, to Dieter and Karina's question, this is a, an exciting way to, to also promote and support diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, so I think, in terms of when we have open calls, um, the attributes we're looking for are folks that are not necessarily already into open science or data science, but are curious of doing doing better and and learning together. So we're looking for teams that have that do have PI support to to spend this time together, even though there there might not be skills um, in open science or data science yet. We have one from YAE. You mentioned GitHub. Any thoughts on the recent discussion of GitHub and Microsoft using code hosted on GitHub for the Copilot AI tool? It's an example of a clash between corporations and open science advocates. Yes. Uh, I, well, great question. And I actually don't know that much about Copilot um, yet. I need to, I think I need to learn more <laughs> before having a good response to your question. But thanks. Can I jump in and ask a question, Alex, since we're, uh, yeah, I, so, so one of the, an idea that's relatively, oh my goodness, um, an idea that's relatively new to me, but I've seen popping up more and more frequently is this idea that, that academia should shift away from a model where we have uh, PIs who are sort of, you know, jacks of all trades, sort of can do everything, 
to a model where academic research is, um, you know, is more, you know, people specialize more in certain things. And so like the kind of stuff that you're learning to do, um, which, is, which is data science, you know, if somebody's investing their time in learning data science, that's time they're not investing in doing some other thing that might also be an important part of their job as an ecologist, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts about that, that idea? Like, should we have people, should academia have like data scientists and, you know, I don't know, grant writers and field scientists or, or however, you know, statisticians or, you know, however we divide it up. Do you think that that's, we're getting to the point where we need to sort of rethink the model of, of academia? Yeah, um, I do. I do think th that's all really interesting. And I, I do think we, it's time to rethink the model of academia. Um, I, I really think going more towards team science and the idea that like nobody can, nobody can do it all. Nobody can learn everything that they ever wanted to do with R and write grants and communicate and mentor their community. Um, and so I, I think if we maybe took more emphasis off of the the faculty being the the like the only person with us with a um with a job <laughs> a stable job and with um the credit for everything that goes on but think about that more as a team um there can be i think there there can be overlapping skill sets like that's what we want we want folks who maybe special you know maybe specialize more on the data science side, but can communicate really well with the folks writing grants or, or doing field work. Um, but I think like thinking about labs as teams rather than as PI focused is, is gonna be hard, but I think that that's the way we should go. I actually just saw a, um, something on Twitter where when some, somebody announced that their, their team had gotten tenure instead of saying like, I got tenure. And I thought that was very cool. I have a question. Um, I'll give a chance for anyone else. If they have any other remaining questions, they can ask it. Um, but yeah, my final question is, have you noticed that perhaps there's any conflicts with maybe trying to be more transparent and more teamwork with maybe creativity? Um, the example I'm thinking of is like, we have a lot of style sheets or um, similar styling in terms of what we should do. And so we'll stay with colors and plots. It has to be colorblind friendly, it has to show contrast. And then suddenly everyone's doing blue, orange, and gray, and nobody is trying to like experiment at all. Have you noticed any weird kind of conflicts in terms of say creativity trying to, or with greater team collaboration? That's a good question. Um, I guess I have seen more creativity um, yeah. because I think like, you know, if, if every scientist, you know, if every scientist isn't needing to design a color palette and then also learn that Excel accessibility and colorblindness is important and then retrofit everything they've done. Like if they start off by being able to use an existing color palette in order to express their science and then spend more time on the creative ideas around science. I think that's, I think that's a great thing. Um, that's the examples I've seen. I agree too. I'm happy you, you were to say that though. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cool. Great. Um, so thanks everyone. I really appreciate you all uh, coming to the plenary. Uh, thank you, Julia, for giving the great talk and for answering all these questions. We're going to be switching over now to an informal discussion through another Zoom link. That Zoom link has been dropped in the chat.